All right, can everyone hear me all right? I can hear myself reverberating, so it's it's got to be enough amplification there. Um, all right, well, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. My name is Aaron Rossetto from NI, and what I'd like to do in this presentation is to shine a spotlight on some of the RF knock blocks that we ship within UHD, which is the uh, driver for USRP SDRs, because I'm not sure even people who are familiar with UHD and USRPs realize what's there. There's some really good, powerful blocks that just ship uh, by default that have source code associated with them. And I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that they were there. So I'll talk a bit about myself. And then for people for whom RF knock is kind of a foreign concept, uh, I don't have a lot of time in this presentation, but I'll give a very quick overview of what I mean when I say RF knock. And then we'll look at each of the blocks that I want to highlight. And at the end, I've got a slide on hints and tips for using these blocks. I have been with NI for just about 22 years now, the last two and a half or so with the SDR squad, uh, and most recently as the UHD maintainer, which is a really great fit for me because I have a long-standing interest in software-defined radio, particularly as it pertains to monitoring public safety uh, communications. So at uh, Barry Duggan's request earlier this year, I gave a presentation to the GNU Radio Amateur uh, Radio Special Interest Group about Project 25 and some of the experiments that I've done with that. And I also presented last year at Virtual GRCon 2020 that goes much more in depth about RF NOC uh, and some of the changes that we've made to the framework for the UHD 4.0 release. So if RF NOC is foreign to you and you wanna take a deeper dive, I suggest taking a look at that presentation. Okay, so the very quick overview of RF knock is it's essentially a framework for being able to do DSP in the FPGA that you would find on a USRP device that supports RF knock. And the way that these algorithms are described should be very familiar to this entire audience. They're done in terms of flow graphs, where in this case, the, uh, the nodes in the graph are DSP algorithms, and then the edges define the data transfer between them much as you would draw a flow graph in GNU Radio Companion. So looking at the RF knock architecture from, uh, from space, essentially, on the left-hand side, you have the transport adapters, which provide ingress and egress for radio data. Um, in the middle is a, a big old router that can uh, connect uh, endpoints to each other. And then what I have highlighted in red is what we're going to be talking about today. The computation blocks, the DSP elements, uh, that we ship in UHD, or alternatively, that you can create uh, through the out-of-tree RF knock block creation process, for which we have some really good tutorials that Neil Pandea and uh, Jonathan Pendlum have led uh, in the past and I think are also available on YouTube. So if you're talking about writing your own DSP out-of-tree block, um, it, you know, you'll You'll have to go look at that, but there may be cases where you can get by with some of the, the simpler, more common algorithms that we have built in uh, to UHD. So for example, um, I have some code here that creates one of these flow graphs where a, uh, the radio element is connected to a digital down converter, which in turn is connected to an FIR filter, and then the output of that FIR filter goes to a stream endpoint so that data can be sent back to the host. So like I said, we're gonna be focusing on these computation elements, the DSP, uh, uh, DSP blocks that are in UHD. And I break them down into five separate areas. Uh, the first being mathematical operations, second being filtering and windowing functions, the third being ways to get data uh, into and out of a graph that do not end in an antenna, so alternate sources and sinks, stream manipulation, and finally, spectral computation. And on this uh, slide here, the Python logo indicates blocks for which we have support in our UHD Python API. You'll notice that not all of them have it, but that doesn't mean you can't use these blocks from Python. In some cases, like the split stream block, for instance, there's really no API to, to speak of, and you can get a reference to the block uh, because every block is a common base class. And the GNU radio icon beside the blocks indicates 
blocks for which we have GNU Radio 3.8 support in our GR Edis repository on GitHub uh, under the maint 38 uhd 4.0 branch. Yes, we know that's, that's pretty old at this point. We are working to support these on GNU Radio 3.9 uh, and above. So we're getting there. So for each block, what you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of the slide is sort of a graphical diagram indicating the block's input ports and output ports and the data types that they expect. Uh, each block has a unique 32-bit ID called the NOC ID, which is just a little detail, but in a lot of cases, that block ID was chosen sort of cheekily uh, uh, with respect to the actual block. And I wanted to highlight that because there's a couple that actually make me smile every time I think about it. Uh, blocks themselves uh, can be configurable in terms of um, how, their, how the HDL is instantiated in the FPGA so that you can make trade-offs in certain cases between FPGA floor space and capabilities. And those are set in the image file that describes the RF knock image core that goes on the FPGA um, as YAML data. Uh, and, and in this example, I've got a, a DUC and a DDC block where I specifically set the num ports parameter to one. I think by default, you'll find that the DUCs and DDCs have a pair of ports, but in the case where you don't need that, you want to save some FPGA real estate, you might want to dial that down to one. And some of these blocks have a considerable number of options to allow you to configure uh, how they are instantiated. And then each block also has some runtime parameters that control its behavior at runtime, which typically your application is uh, going to be involved in setting, whether that is through the um, GNU Radio Companion block parameters, which is probably the highest level at which you can change these things, or if you have an instance of the specific block controller class via methods on it, either in Python or C++, or going a little bit lower level than that through the property mechanism, a lot of these blocks advertise properties um, that ha and there's a generic set get API, uh, which can be used if the block doesn't have a block controller because these are part of the block controller's base class. And then at the very lowest level, you could actually do direct register writes to the block's register map if you wanted. I would advise you not to do that because you know, there is danger that way. It's extremely tricky to get right and you're better off using some of the higher level ways to access these parameters uh, because you know, the higher level you get, the more support um, and help and less probability of you, you know, really messing stuff up. Okay, now onto the blocks, beginning with the mathematical computation. The first one is the adder subtractor block, which has an RF knock ID of hex ADD and a bunch of zeros. It, get it, because it, it adds. Um, this block, pretty simply takes two input streams of signed 16-bit complex data uh, and then produces the sum and difference of each sample at its output. Very, very simple block, but it illustrates how to use either Verilog, VHDL, or HLS in the block design synthesis. Uh, and we provide, I think, implementations of all three of those in UHD, and then that use impl parameter will uh, uh, tell the framework which one to instantiate and use uh, when you use a block. I think by default it's Verilog because most of the blocks are in Verilog, but if you wanted to see how you could write your own block in one of these other HLSs, um, this is how you would do it. Okay, the next block is a log power block that computes an estimate of that formula which didn't render correctly, awesome. That's supposed to be um, log to the base two of the square root of I squared plus Q squared, but you probably already knew that and then stores the result, which is a scalar value, in the upper 16 bits of each 32-bit output item. And there are parameters here to add some random noise to kind of spread out the, the quantization error. Moving average block does exactly as it sounds. It takes in uh, a stream of samples, it sums the last n samples, and divides it by a divisor, and outputs that through the output port. And in this case, you can control the length and the divisor uh, at runtime. Okay, onto the filtering blocks. We have the classic FIR block that everybody knows and loves, but it is extraordinarily configurable. 
and I list the parameters there, uh, this allows you to make some trade-offs between the way that the FIR filter should work based on your application and how much FPGA resources it will need uh, uh, to be able to be instantiated. For instance, if you don't need to reload coefficients at runtime, if you just have a fixed set, then you can disable reloadable coefficients, save yourself some registers. Similarly, um, you know, if you have symmetric coefficients, then you could save multipliers by uh, enabling that. Or skip zero coefficients assumes that uh, in your runtime parameters, any zero coefficients will remain zero coefficients. They'll never change, which is useful for things like half-band filters. And the coefficients can be changed at runtime, again, assuming that you've enabled the re reloadable coefficients uh, parameter, which I believe is, is true by default. All right, we also have an IIR filter that implements a variable length delay line with runtime configurable alpha, beta, and delay parameters. Pretty straightforward and a pretty poorly rendered function. Cool. And then there's your standard window function typically used before an FFT. Um, does exactly what it says. For each input sample, it multiplies it by uh, the window coefficients and then you know, outputs the result uh, to the output. You can set the maximum window size in samples, which you'd want to make a power of two, uh, and that would give you some control over the number of uh, registers that are used to store the coefficients. Okay, on to the sources and sinks. First one is the null source sink. This is a very, very simple block that, as a source, produces incrementing sample data that you can also have throttled so that you won't constantly spam uh, uh, the bus with data. You can have it uh, uh, wait a certain number of clock cycles before producing uh, the next uh, sample output. It can also slurp in whatever data you put into the sync input, um, and then anything coming into the loopback input goes directly to the loopback output, and there are counters on each of these. So you can monitor the counters to make sure that you are seeing the expected number of samples uh, that you want. Now, given the, the source data being incrementing samples you know, isn't particularly useful. It's probably not going to work well with your DSP, but it's great for just testing flow um, and, and getting things working in the first place before you start using uh, your actual source, uh, like a radio, for instance. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this block because it is a very useful block. So what it does is it replays sample data that is stored in RAM or stores incoming sample data into that RAM, and you can kind of uh, uh, play back and record at will. So I liken it to a Cheddar VCR. Um, the one thing I will say about this block is that in a lot of cases, the block controller API and the set of properties that a block advertises are, are pretty similar. In a lot of cases, they don't, they, they don't diverge greatly. This is one case where they kind of do because Michael West and my colleague Matt Prost put a lot of time and effort into designing a really good API to make using the replay block as, as simple uh, as possible because there are some caveats here. Uh, samples need to be aligned correctly based on the size of your uh, RAM uh, data bus, for instance, and things have to be at sample boundaries. And that API uh, will enforce that and will make sure that things are, uh, are coerced such that you'll have the best chance of, of success. We also ship a, an example that uses the replay block. And now I believe it is part of the default image on the X330 and, uh, or sorry, the X310, and I want to say the N310 uh, as well. So the latest images will have these on there for. Uh, for your use, connected directly to stream endpoints. Again, to lower the, uh, uh, the activation energy of getting one of these things uh, to work in your design. Okay, the keep one in end block, pretty simple. We'll forward the first of a sample or of a packet and then discard the next n minus one samples or packets. And whether it discards samples or packets is controllable via a parameter, naturally. Uh, where the packet size is uh, denoted by uh, the assertion of the TLAS signal in the AXI stream protocol. Uh, 
And at runtime, you can set that end parameter as well as the mode. The split stream block seems conceptually very simple, and it is. Given a number of input ports, it will split out that signal to some number of branches so that you'll end up with number of inputs times number of branches output ports just repeating that data. And while it sounds very simple, there is a little wrinkle here. And it has to do with the RF knock architecture and uh, features that we call property propagation and action propagation. So um, the, the way that uh, this block forwards any actions or properties that comes in on these edges um, is, is a little bit tricky. And I wrote the block controller for this block. So I made sure to put a really good comment in the header file indicating the rules for, well, when, when an action arrives on an output branch of an output port, it will be broadcast here. Or when there's a property propagation event, it will forward this way to these ports and these branches. So it's worth taking a look if you, if you should decide that you want to use a split stream block in your application. And then the switchboard block was uh, contributed by a summer intern that we had last year, Jesse Zhang. And what it does is switches uh, any input port, allows you to route it to any output port. The block controller has a really nice API. It's a single function called connect. You give it the input number and the output number, and it will make that connection. Uh, if you decide to use the properties to talk to this thing, you have to set the input select and the output select uh, separately. So again, here's another case where there's a nice API, but you can still use the properties and it takes a little bit more effort to, to get them to work. All right, now on to the last chunk of blocks, sort of the spectral blocks. There's the digital down converter and up converter, uh, which are part of, I think, every default RF knock uh, image following the radio, right? Which is where you'd expect to most often to have it. Let you set the input rate and the output rate, uh, or if you're using the uh, property mechanism, I think we break out the ratio properly, property separately. So if you wanted to work in terms of ratio, then you could set the property. Otherwise, you can do, uh, otherwise you could set the input rate and the output rate, uh, and it will do the math and set the ratio for you automatically. All right, so the FFT, everybody knows and loves the FFT. And as I was putting together this presentation, I thought it was kind of strange, the selection of options that it provided. There's a way to tell the block that you want either complex output data, magnitude data, or mag squared data. And then the shift parameter indicates how that data should be arranged in the output stream, whether you want the DC component first, followed by positive and then negative frequencies, or if you want the negative frequencies and then your zero component in the middle, then positive frequencies, or completely backwards, the other way around. And it was interesting to me, uh, you know, why, why might this block support these things? And uh, I was listening to, I, I have to admit, I've been fascinated by Hash's talk on Monday about looking at power meter data. And he was talking about Sandia Labs um, frequency hopping spread spectrum toolkit and how he uses that to get uh, the very, to, to look at the entire ISM band and to have tagged uh, messages from power meters, which worked better, he was saying, than having a, a really big polyphase channelizer, which, you know, took up all, all the cores uh, of his CPU and probably GPU as well. Um, and I thought, well, that's, that's fascinating. I would love to see an RF knock block that did what some of these Sandia Labs tools do. So I was looking at the code to see how feasible this was. And um, the first thing that the code does in its work function is it takes a coarse FFT of the incoming spectrum, looking for areas with higher power, then it focuses in and does like a, a, a frequency correction on them. Well, if you look at the code, it does an FFT, then goes across those samples, computing mag squared, and then rearranges them to have the negative frequency components first followed by the positive frequency components because I guess they're not like that in whatever implementation of the FFT he was using. And I'm looking at this and thinking, oh wow, we have an RF knock block that does that already. So 
I guess the point here is I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about reading my power meter and that there's a reason for some of these configurations that, that we offer and that it's there. So I can sort of really quickly get started on prototyping something just with this entry block. And then finally, the world famous phosphor block. You can see it in the demo that we have uh, in the expo, expo hall. What the phosphor block does is it accepts FFT input data. So you need to do an FFT before it and produces two output streams of 8-bit data. One is histogram data, uh, which is the upper part of that display. And it's sort of a heat map of each of the frequency bins of the FFT uh, on the x-axis. The y-axis has different power bins. And as the phosphor block reads FFTs, it accumulates um, the, the values in each of the frequency bins based on power. And then uh, the brighter colors, based on, on the color scheme that you choose, indicate uh, where the, the vast majority of each frequency bin, where the, where the power was, was uh, spent, right? Um, and then that red line that you see is a peak hold that can decay at a configurable rate. We also show the average in there. You can't see it. It's a, a thin white line. And at the bottom is waterfall data, which is a historical view of, um, uh, of the power in each of the FFT frequency bins that scrolls over time. So it's a pretty specialized block, but it's great uh, to make really dynamic, visually appealing demos and very quickly allows you to visualize a spectrum. And there are a ton of runtime parameters here. Um, and as we, we and my colleague Wade, Fye, Wade Fife were trying to figure this out, uh, we made sure that we documented what we figured out as we sort of reverse engineered how this stuff worked because there was no comments for it before. And we added those comments uh, into UHD. So Hopefully, if you decide to use the phosphor block, those comments will help guide, uh, guide you into setting these, uh, these parameters uh, appropriately. So finally, for my hits and tips, uh, I've said a number of times, go look at the source. We, I like to think we do a pretty good job of documenting things. Uh, but also, a lot of these blocks have a very good comprehensive test bench that you can look to to understand exactly how it's going to work in some of these uh, more rare configurations. And like I said, the block controller header files usually have really good comments about how each of the functions works, what it, uh, what it changes, and, and the range of values that it allows, uh, as well as the rfnoc block verilog file as well has a lot of additional details. And like the replay block, some of these blocks have C++ examples that are in the hosts, uh, exam host example subdirectory that you can take a look at uh, to see how you can get these to work uh, and how to, to correctly configure them. And speaking of configurability, uh, as you saw, some of these blocks have a lot of different configuration that in some cases may not make sense when set a, a certain way. So if you are using uh, sort of a non-default configuration, just take care and make sure that um, you're not getting any unexpected data or unexpected behavior uh, because that can happen when you set an invalid sort of combination of, of some of these things, maybe in some of the use cases that were more lightly tested than some of the other more common ones. All right, and I'm going to be here until Friday, so please come and see me if you have any questions. Come to the Expo Hall and see the Phosphor block in all of its glory, um, and I'd be, I'll would be i be on chat to monitor that, see if there's any questions there. But with that, I think that's my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Aaron.